What does the landscape of entropy in the universe look like? Shall well, we? entropy is hard to localize. It's a property of systems, not of parts of systems, right? Um, Having said that, we can do approximate uh, answers to the question. The answer is black holes are huge in entropy. Most of, let's put it this way, the whole observable universe that we're in had a certain amount of entropy before stars and planets and black holes started to form. 10 to the 88th, I can even tell you the number, okay? The single black hole at the center of our galaxy has entropy, 10 to the 90th. Single black hole center of our galaxy has more entropy than the whole universe used to have not too long ago. So most of the entropy in the universe today is in the form of black holes. Okay, that's fascinating, first of all. Uh, but second of all, if we take black holes away, what are the different interesting perturbations in entropy across space? What, what is the, what, where do we Earthlings fit into that? The interesting thing to me is that if you start with a system that is isolated from the rest of the universe, and you start it at low entropy, there's almost a theorem that says if you're very, very, very low entropy, then you, the system looks pretty simple. Because there's low entropy means there's only a small number of ways that you can rearrange the parts to look like that. So there's, if there's not that many ways, the answer is going to look simple. But there's also almost a theorem that says when you're at maximum entropy, the system is going to look simple because it's all smeared out. If it had like interesting structure, then it would be complicated, right? So entropy in this isolated system only goes up. That's the second law of thermodynamics. But complexity starts low, goes up, and then goes down again. Sometimes people mistakenly think that complexity or life or whatever is fighting against the second law of thermodynamics, fighting against the increase of entropy. That is precisely the wrong way to think about it. We are surfers riding the wave of increasing entropy. We rely on increasing entropy to survive. That is part of what makes us special. This table maintains its stability mechanically, by which I mean there's molecules, there have forces on each other, and it holds up. You and I aren't like that. We maintain our stability dynamically by ingesting food, fuel, right? Food and water and air and so forth, burning it, increasing its entropy. We are non-equilibrium quasi-steady state systems. We are using the fuel the universe gives us in the form of low entropy energy to maintain our stability. I just wonder what that mechanism of surfing looks like. I mean, that's where... First of all, I mean, one question to ask, do you think it's possible to have a kind of science of complexity where you have very precise ways or clearly defined ways of measuring complexity? I think it is, and I think we don't. It's possible to have it. I don't think we yet have it. Because, you know, in part because complexity is not a univalent thing. There's different ideas that go under the rubric of complexity. One version is just Kamalgarov of complexity, right? If you have a configuration or a string of numbers or whatever, can you compress it so that you have a small program that will output that? That's Kamalgarov of complexity. But that's the complexity of a string of numbers, okay? It's not like the complexity of a problem, right? Computational complexity, the traveling salesman problem or factoring large numbers. That's a whole different kind of question that is also about complexity. So we don't have a sort of unified view of it. So you think it's possible to have a complexity of a physical system? Yeah, In the same absolutely. way we do entropy? Yeah. You think that's a Sean Carroll paper or what? We're working on various things. Uh, my the, the glib thing that I'm trying to work on right now with, with a student is complexogenesis. How does complexity come to be if all the universe is doing is moving from low entropy to high entropy? It's a sexy uh, name. It's a good name. Yeah, I like the name. Oh, now he's got to write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a, a name yeah. arose by any other name. Uh, what? Which? Which? Uh, uh, in which context? Uh, the 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 birth of complexity are you most interested in? Well, I think it comes in stages, right? So I think that if you go from the, the uh, I'm a, again a physicist. So biologists studying evolution will talk about you know, how complexity evolves all the time, the complexity of the genome, the complexity of our physiology, right? But they take for granted that life already existed you know, and, and 
entropy is increasing and so forth. I want to go back to the beginning and say the early universe was simple and low entropy, and entropy increases with time, and the universe sort of differentiates and becomes more complex. But that that statement, which is indisputably true, has different meanings, because complexity has different meanings. So sort of the most basic primal version of complexity is, is what you might think of as configurational complexity. That's what Kamal Grove gets at. How much information do you need to specify the configuration of the system? Then there's a whole other step where subsystems of the universe start burning fuel, right? So in many ways, a planet and a star are not that different in configurational complexity. They're both spheres with density high at the middle and getting less as you go out. But there's something fundamentally different because the star only survives as long as it has fuel, right? I mean, then it turns into a brown dwarf or a white dwarf or whatever. But as a star, as a main sequence star, it is an out of equilibrium system, but it's more or less static, right? Like if I spill the coffee mug and it falls, in the process of falling, it's out of equilibrium, but it's also changing all the time. A specific kind of system is where it looks sort of macroscopically stationary, like a star, but underneath the hood, it's burning fuel to beat the band in order to maintain that stability. So as stars form, that, that's a different kind of complexity that comes to be. Then there's another kind of complexity that comes to be, roughly speaking, at the origin of life, because that's where you have information really being gathered and utilized by subsystems of the universe. And then arguably, there's any number of stages past that. I mean, one of the most obvious ones to me is, we talk about simulation theory, but you and I run simulations in our heads. They're just not that good, but we imagine different hypothetical futures, right? Bacteria don't do that. So that's the kind of information processing that is a form of complexity. And so I would like to understand all these stages and how they fit together. Yeah, imagination. Yeah, mental time travel. Yeah, the, the things going on in my head when I'm imagining worlds are, are super compressed representations of those worlds, but to get to the essence of them, and maybe it's possible with non-human computing type devices to do those kinds of simulations in more and more compressed ways. There's an argument to be made that literally what separates human beings from other species on Earth is our ability to imagine counterfactual hypothetical futures. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big features. I don't know if it's a it, Everyone has their own favorite little feature, but that is, uh, that's why I said there's an argument to be made. I did a podcast episode on it with Adam Bully. It developed slowly. I did a di different podcasts. Sorry to keep mentioning podcast episodes I did, but Malcolm McIver, who is an engineer at Northwestern, has a theory about um, one of the major stages in evolution is when fish first climbed onto land. And if, I mean, of course, that is a major stage of evolution, but in particular, there's a cognitive shift because when you're a fish swimming under the water, the attenuation length of light in water is not that long. You can't see kilometers away. You can see meters away. And you're moving at meters per second. So all of the evolutionary optimization is make all of your decisions on a time scale of less than a second. <laughs> when you see something new, you have to make a rapid fire decision what to do about it. As soon as you climb onto land, you can essentially see forever, right? You can see stars in the sky. Um, so now a whole new mode of reasoning opens up where you see something far away. And rather than saying, look up table, I see this, I react. You can say, okay, I see that thing. What if I did this? What if I did that? What if I did something different? And, and that's you know, the birth of imagination eventually. 